Good morning, New Day. Acts chapter 3 today. Can you believe it? From verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But, verse 6 starts, Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's just look through some obvious points here quickly because the title for this, for this week and for next week actually, is called Servants of the Gospel. Context-wise, there is a miracle that happens. There is a guy who has never walked, who suddenly is able to walk. And remember, the book of Acts is written by Luke. Luke was a doctor, a physician, who is very clear to point out the suddenness and the miraculous nature of what happened to this lame man. He's not saying a maybe and an if. He's saying, listen, there was a, something happened that a whole lot of people saw. A man got healed. So I just want to give us a quick four points in terms of its context for where we're going with the preach. Number one, the miracle happened in the context of children of God going to the place of prayer. In other words, they were about to engage the place and the priority of prayer. Prayer should create an expectation. And when prayer creates an expectation in us, suddenly we're in the place where God can come, God can intervene, things can happen because God himself is present with us. That's the first one. The second one is that lame people want to be able to walk. His expectation, the lame man, wasn't that he would walk because it was outside of his parameters because he'd never been able to. But what he could do was he could ask for money because he can't work. This isn't money to lounge around. This is money to eat, money perhaps for accommodation because he's in the place where he cannot provide for himself. So he's asking these guys to just, can you contribute towards my survival? What they're looking at is and saying, actually, the real problem here, the real problem for a lame man is that he needs to walk. The real problem for spiritually dead people is that they need to be made alive. Money doesn't do that. Money can help earthly temporal things, but it is the gospel of Jesus and the breaking through of the gospel through the heart and the activity of Jesus through servants of the gospel that can actually make a difference in somebody's life. I can almost read that in this passage, we can see that what really happens is that deep inside the heart of a person, like we see in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, deep inside of the heart of a person, God has set eternity. God has set a desire in people who are lame, who can't find the path. Something in them says there is a path. There is a path for my life. There is a destiny. I wish there was a way I could walk and find the path and get on it to find out why I'm here, what I'm meant to be doing, and where I'm meant to be going. Number three. These apostles, these servants of the gospel, had been gifted by the Holy Spirit. And in an instance that required Jesus, they did two things. They released their faith and they released their spiritual gifts in a way that benefited the man who needed them most. This man needed Jesus. And because of their faith and because of their spiritual gifts that they released, he was able to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and have his lameness healed. And number four, these men, these apostles, what they would have been doing is setting an example because the fact that it's recorded and people saw and people were amazed 
All Peter and John were going to do was to go and pray, to go and engage in expectation, to be with God. They don't know what the Lord is about to unfold. But when the opportunity comes, they rise up in their faith, they release their gifts, they rise up in their confidence that Jesus can do something. And what happens? They become an instant example to everybody around them. And everyone learns from them and people see, oh, so to be a disciple maybe includes that stuff. The supernatural breaking into the natural. And it's wonderful. And so what you find is that people would have been, uh, had the faith to exercise their gifts. They would have had the faith to exercise compassion, uh, the faith to exercise uh, belief in the, the unnatural or the supernatural suddenly coming into the natural. And through this we see that in the bigness of this spontaneous miracle and everyone seeing what's going on, there is a message that the Lord wants us to see. Actually, the main point of Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, which is this. Christians, Peter and John, Christians were moved with compassion to minister to a lame man. And the principle behind it is they saw an opportunity to serve someone with the love of God, and they took it. And that is the lesson in the same way that Jesus, before the night he was betrayed, had washed the feet of his disciples. What we find here is that this whole miracle occurred. Everything happened because there was a willingness in the hearts of these two apostles to just serve somebody with the love of God. And remember, the miracles that followed are up to Jesus. Jesus can do the miraculous or he's not going to. We can't make the miraculous happen, but we can humble ourselves and serve those who really need it. Servants of the gospel serve. And that's the whole point. How would you respond if Jesus appeared to you right now and took off your shoes and washed your feet? How would you handle it? The king standing before you doing this. How do you think people respond when others humble themselves to come and serve them? Their hearts are opened in ways they never would have been open before. And at the roots of our calling is the desire to imitate Jesus and to imitate his servant-heartedness. And after washing their feet, this is what Jesus said in John 13 from verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also or to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. That doesn't mean you've got to walk around the bowl in your car and start washing everyone's feet because contextually today, that wouldn't mean a whole lot. It'll just make a whole lot of people run the other way. But in those days, a servant washed the feet of a visitor to a house. When someone comes to visit New Day, when someone comes to visit you, in your mind, you put on your serving attitude and you say, how can I be a blessing and how can I be of assistance to you? But let me ask you this, on any given Sunday, how many of us really go to church or on any given home group meeting or any given business meeting, who actually goes with the attitude and the desire and the eagerness to serve others? But this has to become a bigger thing for us. In Matthew 20, from verse 25, it says, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and that their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Listen to these words. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It is no secret that most people come to church as consumers rather than contributors. Where do they get that from? Because the churches they go to allow them to do that. I've had the absolute privilege of going to Christian conferences around the world it's never ceased to amaze me how two things always happen. The first is that the main speakers are treated like royalty and they're served in every way and the common people, the hoi polloi in Greek, can't get near them. But they're, they're fated for their apparent greatness when in reality all they are is exercising supernatural gifts that God gave them. 
And they're meant to be washing the feet off. They're meant to be serving. They're meant to be laying their lives down as a ransom. They're meant to be their slave. They're meant to be the servant. There's meant to be a servant-heartedness. On the other side of the scale, I also see that the reason that these superstars are kept back from the people is because the people are always wanting to go to them and somehow associate with them. And all these guys are trying to do is minister God's word and they're being swamped by people. All in all, we've got this thing wrong. And you're going to see as we progress in this preach that we need to turn the thing on its head that those who would be called by God to lead and to serve need to have the mentality of a servant, a slave, and one who will lay down their lives for the sake of others. That is the mark of leadership, to serve, not to be served. We want leadership in the church, serve rather than being served. We want leadership in our homes, serve rather than being served. Serving is the way to some form of greatness. Maybe not on earth, but certainly in God's eyes. We've learned to accept consumerism in the church as if there's nothing we can do about it. People put the money in the offering basket, which pays for a paid staff who is supposed to do everything so they can come to the meeting, get blessed, get fed, get up, and go. It's fair, it's efficient, but it's not what the Bible reflects that the body of Christ, the church, should be whenever we meet together. We are servants of the gospel. Philippians 2 from verse, eight, from verse 1. Philippians 2 from verse 1 to verse 8 reads this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You can hear there's a whole lot of let all of us behave the same way happening there. Do nothing. From selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And God wants us to resemble his son even in the church family. Why don't you ever take this passage in in Philippians chapter 2, work it through in your quiet times, and say, Lord, show me how I can best reflect this. Do we really show up? to our gatherings looking to serve. I'm telling you, as, as I say this now, some of you are thinking, yo, yo, when I get back to church, Greg's putting a burden on me. He's, he's laying a heavy on me. Now it, it's hard enough in the week and I do everything. Now I've got to come to this place and all of a sudden I've now got to do even more. I mean, when am I ever not going to do something? We live busy lives. We, if we're honest, we want the church to be a place where we rest, where we're fed, where we can put our feet up. In fact, our only complaint about the church is that we sit in nice, comfortable red chairs when we should be sitting in lazy boys, especially with social distancing, that we can just kick open and put our popcorn and our Coke and watch and just, just wonderful. Can I tell you what? It's a wrong attitude. It's a whole wrong approach. The Lord Jesus said in Acts 20, 35, In all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus said, if you actually change your attitude and you come with an attitude of, listen, I want to serve rather than being served, literally you will feel blessed. I want to be blessed. I want the blessed life now. Then go and serve somebody. Takers are the most miserable people on earth. They just want to take. They're miserable. It's the inability of someone to take our eyes off of ourselves and put them on someone else that actually destroys us. Takers are horrible to be around. It's the very thing Jesus wants to save us from. The Holy Spirit wants to equip us to serve others. Servants of the gospel. The most humble people on earth are often the happiest. If you've ever traveled and you've gone to humble circumstances, those people, there's a spring in their step. There's a joyfulness given by the Spirit of God. Imagine gathering with a group of people who all they're trying to do is outserve each other. What an environment that would be. Humble people, considering everyone else better than themselves, of greater significance, and 
regardless of what God's done with you, you're interested, you care, you're concerned for everybody else. Imagine how even a visitor who doesn't like people or doesn't like to be made much of, how they will respond if they find themselves in such a place. They'll be blessed out of their socks. When servants gather together, the reality is this, everyone is built up. No one hates consumerism more than God. Because it's that very mentality that stops the church having the vibrancy and the drive that he intended for her. Don't give up on the dream. The church does not have to consist of groups of needy people when all they do is bleat about the fact that they're unhappy with this and this hasn't been done for them and they feel underfed and they this and they that, when in reality they're getting more than enough. They're just greedy, needy takers. That's not what we see in Acts chapter 3. What we see in Acts chapter 3 are two men who love Jesus, walking together, going to pray. They find an opportunity. They choose to serve that person. And what happens? The gospel breaks out. It's a beautiful story. You know, you can thrive when you come into a group of people who've aligned themselves with Jesus Christ, who said, I've come to serve, not to be served. It's by serving one another that in any form of corporate gathering we get to experience God himself you see it in, in, in Corinth when uh, Paul was explaining to the church in Corinth you know all of you have been gifted by the Holy Spirit now immediately the sinful nature and the fleshy nature says well what's my gift what's yours which gift is better which one is more supernatural which one should I have which one will give me more recognition which is the one that's the super gift we miss the point entirely the point is this, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he blesses you with a spiritual gift or at least one, probably more, that's supposed to come from you, a natural serving ability. And you know when you're doing it when others are being blessed by you just being there. That's the whole point. You see it here, I mean we just say God gives you an ability to bless others. The spiritual language is manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You know, when something is manifest, it wasn't there and suddenly it's there because it's a gift of the Spirit. The two verses that show us this, you find it in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7. The Message Bible puts that same verse like this. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. I want to be part of that. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12 says this, And so with yourselves. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, Strive to excel in building up the church. The Message Bible puts it like this. It's no different with you. See, since you're so eager to participate in what God is doing, why don't you concentrate on doing what helps everyone in the church? Now, I don't think we could have put it any better than that. Does that image stir excitement in you? The, the, the understanding that God himself wants to move through a human body. How many of you watch movies? Now, please don't quote me on this later. Okay, let's just keep it between you and I. But how many of us have watched horror movies? You know those movies where there's a person who gets like possessed by a demon? I'm not going to mention movie names because some of you are going to go Google it and some of you are going to go watch them. So let me not do that. But the guy gets a demon, you know, and they, and, and you're like, oh. And we believe that stuff can happen. Now, how many of us have been in an environment where someone is actually demon-possessed? And you see this demon takes possession of them and controls their thoughts and their, controls their actions and their words and talk a different language. And you look and you're like, what's going on here? And the reason we watch those movies is because we know that deep inside there's an element of truth to this stuff. Now, why is it that even if it's Hollywood's version of it we're looking at, why is it we don't believe that to the same way someone can be filled 
with the Holy Spirit of God. To also change their language and their behavior and their conduct and their thoughts. Spirit of God. Filling you and I with the desire to serve and giving us gifts or abilities with which to help and serve everybody else. And by the way, if you just get serving in the church with what comes naturally to you, your gifts are going to bubble to the surface and you're going to find them out anyway. But if we can see demonic manifestation, why can we not see the manifestation of the Spirit? And it should be wow when we do see it. I mean, do we really believe in spirit manifestation the way we believe in demonic manifestation? Good question. Our gatherings, our meetings, our church meetings, our home groups, our prayer meetings, do you know that they're supposed to look supernatural? <laughs> I mean, some of us would be terrified for days if we saw a demon-possessed person. I could tell you some of the stories I've had <laughs> with, with dealing with the demonic. But imagine what it's like when you see someone who just exudes the life of God. The pleasure of God just coming through them. The Spirit of God, the, the righteousness, joy, and peace of being filled with the Holy Spirit. How a whole atmosphere can change in a place with one person just walking closer to the Lord. Should be memorable. Should be amazing. Let me ask this. How would you feel on your drive to the building or your drive to a home group when you're anticipating that a whole lot of other people are coming there with the desire to serve others with what God the Holy Spirit is doing in them? I think it would be amazing. I think we've become too easily satisfied. We invite someone to church, they say, oh, what a lovely place, what lovely people, what a great preacher, I think I'll be back next week. And reality is they're, they're pleased or they're blessed. Acts 3 from verse 1 to 10 says, the people were in awe. They were in wonder. That's how we want people to leave. We've had this so many times where someone comes to visit the church and they leave saying, no one even knows me here. And, and, and someone came up to me in like the singing type time of the meeting and, and, and gave me a word they said from God that spoke into the very thing I'm wondering about that brought me to this church in the first place because I need answers from God. Like, wow. We need far more of those stories. As a matter of fact, when looking at the spiritual gifts, Paul even encourages all of us to prophesy, to hear the word of the Lord for someone else and go and share it with them. You see, we've settled for the natural. And we've made choices that give little evidence that we believe that whenever we meet together, the Holy Spirit is there to control and direct and empower what we do. And maybe that's why when we meet together, everything's ordinary, normal, humdrum, explainable too many times. Because we haven't opened ourselves up to the blowing of the wind, as Jesus said, where it's unpredictable and God the Holy Spirit can just do things. You see, Paul wanted the believers to show up at meetings with an expectation that God wants to do something to them and God wants to do something through them. That God wants to be the, the channel through whom them as vehicles are able to minister his hands and feet and his voice to other people. If we settle in just receiving from others, we miss out on so much that God has for us. And so I just want to say this. Unfortunately, in church life, this is what happens. We imitate the world too much. What do I mean by that? We look for great uh, leaders. We look for strong communicators. We look for talented musicians. We, we value their gifts. We put them on display. Just like the world, too often we ignore or look past those who don't have what the superstars do. And then we go and violate scripture which says that to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit has been given for the common good. Perhaps what we need to do is make ourselves available with each other to others to say, let's find, through serving in the church, let's find those gifts God's given us. Because this church does not need more great leaders, more strong communicators, more gifted musicians. The church needs the body of Christ to rise up where there's no comparison among us, but just a desire to serve one another. We would never dare to look God in the face and say, by the way, that son of yours, that daughter of yours is pretty worthless. We'd never dare to say it. But sometimes we think it. 
by the way we overlook each other. I think we need to be careful. Last comment. In the context of 1 Corinthians, didn't Paul say that it was through the overlooked, through those we miss, that the glory and the power of God is actually meant to be revealed? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 29. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. I want you to note that those people who are considered foolish, weak, low, and despised are only considered that by the world's standards, not by the church's standards. By the church's standards, they may be incredible. And I want to tell you today, I'm speaking to you as well as to myself, to say let's be servants of this gospel. And as we serve one another out of an expectation for God to move through us, Let's rely on the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what our gifts are that everybody can benefit from us. Let me pray for us. Lord, I do pray that according to these words I've spoken, that Lord, you would bless us, you would enable us, you would speak to us. Lord, give us the attitude of a servant, we pray. We thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you're in the place where uh, you're saying, actually, I'd love to give my life to Jesus, please would you just phone the number on the screen today, tomorrow, Someone will answer, someone will pray with you. It might give you another number. You just phone and say, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus. We have a team available to meet with you, to pray with you, to meet you here at the church, to speak with you over the phone, and to begin your journey of faith with you. God bless you.